folks, how's it going? Dr. Spin, Eclectic Album Reviews, and General Musical Meanderings, and it is time for the final installment of my New Music for 2020 series. I've got six albums ahead for you. All of them are things that I think I could really strongly advocate for. So let's go ahead and get started on it. The first one is Kate Davis. I'm very, very excited about this album. Um, I, I discovered it on a band camp top 100 at the end of last year uh, she makes a, a pretty killer power pop album and it's been a while since i've been able to say that um the thing about power pop is that its history has become so long you know uh, some of those beatles albums that the power pop is sort of a, a, a leg of is coming up on 50 60 years old and the the style is very specific you have to do like certain things in order for it to fit into the sort of power pop category so the tendency is to play into that tradition so strongly that you do very little that's kind of new or distinctive. Kate Davis is extremely clever about how she distinguishes herself in the field of power pop music. Uh, she's a, a bass player and clearly I think has some training. Uh, the way that she sings, the way that she phrases her, her music, uh, I think reveals some, some close study of how music works. I think that you wouldn't be able to come up with a lot of the clever things that she comes up with in her music without having a really good knowledge of how music works and have traveled quite through quite a bit of, of practice. And none of it's technical. It's not like she's showing off amazing chops. It's more like just the concepts and ideas that she uses to make her music and to make her hooks and to, to um, underpin her melody uh, is, is extremely well thought out but always, again, extremely accessible. Uh, well, a great example is the lead track, the song that I'd heard that got me into it, is the very first track in the album is called Daisy. And she does some very, very interesting things with rhythm on that song. So the inspiration for the rhythm of the chorus sounds like to me that she's singing a little seven, a little melody that's in the rhythmic pattern of seven over a two, four beat, adds a little bit of beat so it ends up back on the beat. So you don't notice it in the long run, it doesn't, it doesn't alter anything too much uh, in the big picture. That's the kind of clever stuff she does all over Trophy. So really suggest it, big proponent of this album. I don't think that a wide variety of people I think will get something out of this album. And I'm, I think this guy might be the one to beat. Next one up is Hey Jira, uh, Thread of Gold. This is another Bandcamp recommendation and actually the one that kind of set me off uh, on looking at all of the top 100 albums from that Bandcamp rec from last year. It's kind of a neo soul album, but I, it really floats above a lot of the trappings of that style as well. Kind of like what Kate Davis does within the power pop style. I would kind of relate Hegira's style a little bit to the kind of neo soul, soul style of Erica Badu to a degree. But what they're doing is I think even more, far more atmospheric and probably even less commercial than what Erica Badu uh, does in general for her music. and sparse in the instrumentation. A really great deep, deep grooves on the album. Uh, th there's parts of songs where it's just not much more than a piano and the vocalist. And then these other songs that are just these really great fleshed out tunes with, with kind of uh, insightful, thoughtful lyrics. My understanding is a lot of the music on Thread of Gold was inspired by the lead singers uh, taking a trip through Ethiopia. And there's kind of this thread of spirituality that rolls across the top of the album that was also kind of in a, in vogue with, with neo-soul singers for a while there. Um, but this particular one I think is very strong overall and very convincing and very, very distinctive. So uh, Hezira's Thread of Gold is another one. The next one up, Church of the Cosmic Skull, Everybody's Going to Die. Now it's got a kind of a dark album name, but... Uh, <clears throat> These guys have a very interesting approach, I think, to the way that they've constructed their identity for this album. Even if you don't like any of the music on this album, I think you really have to appreciate the careful way in which they've constructed their identity. So, musically, 
the the band refers strongly to this kind of period of 70s music where uh, bands were sort of playing with progressive rock ideas but weren't really progressive rock like Styx, uh, like uh, ELO, like Supertramp, uh, like Queen, those types of bands. I wouldn't really call them strictly prog bands. They were more like kind of arena rock bands but they all kind of played with some some progressive rock tropes to a little bit. This just superficially. And I think that's definitely the, the vein of music that, that specifically Church of the Cosmic Skull is trying to hit. Church of the Cosmic Skull presents themselves as kind of like this weird religious movement. And I think it's pretty tongue-in-cheek. It's not very serious about that. But they use that to kind of bind together the music on the album. So even though they have these songs that are very um, uh, florid and and uh, colorful, this is kind of gospel underpinnings to it. Which is funny. They're not really an American band. They're from they're from England. So you're talking about a, a, an English band trying to use... Uh, American gospel to give their band a sense of being kind of a religious movement. Uh, pretty pretty clever stuff. Uh, the band's seven members, which is pretty big. Several of them just you know singers and backup singers. And Bill Fisher as the singer, also guitar player, as the mastermind behind the whole thing. Kind of a medium vocalist in some ways. His his technically his vocals are kind of the weakest part of the album, but it, it's also part of the way that the whole thing sells. You know, it, it's, it gives us a sense of almost being kind of revivalist because not many, you know, let's be frank, a lot of like, revivalist singers aren't really all that great, but he puts a lot of emotion into it, a lot of thought into it, and it all fits together into this interesting puzzle. I do have a small complaint about the album because there are some songs that clearly are more fleshed out than others. Um, there's a, a couple songs and they're just kind of straight blues songs and it, it sounds good it, and it fits within the, the band's scope but there's other songs that are definitely more um, colorful than others and so it gives it a little bit of a sense of being inconsistent but still throughout the entire album it's extremely extremely entertaining to listen from beginning to end so again well worth checking that one out okay next one up is We Are The City R.I.P. Rip um, this is kind of a funny one how I discovered these guys Again, I've been kind of going through some Bandcamp recommendations, and I've been listening pretty carefully recently to their, you know, their monthly and weekly roundups for the stuff that they find. And I've been listening to a band, a Bandcamp, you know, best of thing for a given week and stopped it. And when I got back in my car, my phone kind of tapped right back into it, and I didn't realize it was still up. And this came up. It's killer a type baby. And man, the way that this song uh, plays with this riff, a really strong, explosive riff, and then these very cool, like, minimalist, rippling piano uh, textures really caught my attention. I'm like, look, even if I don't have any other song in this album that's worth anything, that song by itself is, is killer. <laughs> it's killer B-side for sure. Uh, but it turns out that even the B-sides on the album uh, have that same, they have that same kind of quirky interplay between um, <clears throat> texture and strength and power and, and melody and all, it all fits together in this very interesting puzzle. These guys are a band that actually in a couple of different places have been referred to as a, pro a prog rock band, um, as has the Church of the Cosmic Skull. And I, being a progressive rock fan from, from way back, I sort of balk at that a little bit. I wouldn't really call these guys a prog rock band by any stretch of the imagination, but they do have a really cool musical sense to what they do. And there is an awareness of some deeper musical ideas, especially in terms of dynamics. It's a very dynamic band that plays with really hushed atmospheres and very um, strong, explosive riffs throughout the album. Uh, and another one that surprised me and just caught me so off guard when I discovered it that I had to I had to investigate closer. It hasn't really disappointed me. It's a good a good one. Okay, next up is Cynics Focus. Now, 
I don't know how I've gotten this far in the game without ever checking out Cynic. I did several years ago listen to listen to Gordian Knot, uh, which is bass player Sean Malone's kind of solo project. And I got into that one because he also plays Chapman Stick, and I was investigating Chapman Stick music at the time. And I knew that he played in a band called Cynic, and I knew that they were very uh, influential within a certain time frame. So I was one of those bands, I put a pin in, I'll go check them out later. And you know, 10, 15 years ago by, you don't really come back up. And then the death of the drummer, Sean Reinhardt, kind of brought the whole thing back up. And I was like, put the pieces together. Oh, this is that band that I've never checked out. So I got Cynics Focus and was immediately blown away by it. Um, I cannot believe that this album was made in 1994. What what kind of reference point does that, does that have? Cynic is... Technically, I, by, by some standards, a, a death metal band or a screaming metal band. But man, they, they are way beyond what your perceptions are of that kind of music. They're extremely uh, facile musicians uh, with a lot of chops. And they bring all those chops to bear on this music, but it's a style of music that can really bear that kind of weight. <laughs> It's almost as if the bass player, Sean Malone, who's the person I'm most familiar with in the band, it's almost like what would happen if Jeff Berlin joined Dream Theater and like um, pushed them into whole other realms, even though I think that what they're doing even on the guitar side is far more interesting than what Dream Theater generally used to do. It just gives way to full-on jazz fusion in some sections. And then it gives way to keyboards, textures, and all this other stuff. So really great um, variety on the album that... that keeps it from being any one thing, which is always the danger when you start getting kind of screaming vocals, is that if it's if it's all one thing the whole time, then it never, it loses its effectiveness. And that's not the case with Cynic. Also, the other really great thing that I like about that, I don't know if I've heard anywhere else, is Cynic uses these vocoder textures on their melodic singing. So it also has this kind of weird electric, cybernetic feel to it that I really like. Uh, super cool. I don't know if it's meant to mask the singer's voice, if it was a, if it was a, uh, uh, aesthetic choice, but it really causes it to be very distinctive. And especially when you have the screaming vocals and the vocoder melody together, it's a very cool texture that I don't think I've heard anywhere else. And again, this is 1994. I mean, I'm sure there's many bands that have been influenced by that and have done a lot of the same things. But man, this is, fascinates me that this album has been sitting around for that long and was so forward thinking at the time. And still, you know, it's a cult classic among certain people, but I'm just surprised that I have never really crossed paths with it earlier. I mean, I'd heard of Cynic, but now, like, I'm a cynic fan. I want to investigate that whole branch of progressive rock a lot more due to the listening to Focus. Great disc. Well worth checking out. Okay, finally, it's Pojikan's Hetk. And I'm not going to try to even pronounce the rest of that. That's going to take me two or three months to even get enough guts up to be able to pronounce a lot of this. Um, last year, Pojikan's first album, their debut album, what ended up being my album of the year. And that's a 2000, 2018 album. So it came out in late 2018, but all throughout 2019, it was the came back and came back and came back. And I really loved it. It's very infectious use of melody, very exuberant style, lots of really great melodies that the lead singer, Walter Susolu, I believe you how you pronounce his name, uh, <clears throat> was coming up with. Kind of a nice cross between Gentle Giant and, and Genesis. And it made me really reconnect with a lot of the roots of what I think is great about progressive rock in, in the first place. And this album, I think, is very interesting. It's a different step in a different direction. And again, you talk about Church of the Cosmic Skull and their identity. This Poja Khan album, uh, in some ways, challenges my idea of what the identity of the band is. Okay, the, 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 on the previous album, the debut, very clearly Poja Khan was a band five, six members, I think. And it was very clear the whole album was very consistently instrumented for that that um, group. This album is much more diverse. And in a way, it almost makes it start to feel like Poja Khan's evolving into a more of a collective than just a band. So lead singer Walter Susulu has a, his fingers in a lot of different aspects of kind of Estonian musical pie, if you will. Um, he's, in addition to being the lead singer for Poja Khan, the primary composer, I believe, for the band, uh, he also is a pretty celebrated uh, conductor. He is connected to various vocal groups throughout the country and has been pretty visible, I think, in that regard for, for a while. And so 
I get the sense that he's kind of pulling in a lot of these uh, these influences, these these entities that he's connected with into the Pojikan identity, which makes it again start to feel more like a collective than just a band. Now there are some songs on on the album that are definitely in the vein of the first album. It clearly, is is the band as it was in the first album with the nice with a with a very exciting melodic approach. Then there's also some straight up just uh, choral singing on there, some composed pieces that are just choral singing, and also some composed pieces on there that are just um, orchestral. And these entities, the uh, the Estonian cello ensemble and this vocal group that he's connected with, um, a lot of those songs are actually composed by other people. So why bring them into Pojikan? That's a great question. Very hard to discern because everything that's been written about this album is currently in Estonian. Good news is that the new album has, in addition to a lyric sheet, English translations of all the lyrics. So I don't have to fight that like I did with the first album, trying to figure out what the songs are about or trying to put it in Google Translate. And that, you know, that doesn't barely even work at all, as you can see if you've seen my previous post. And look, I'm all for broadening the scope on the album. I think it's a pretty cool uh, idea. And if I'm, to be frank with myself, if I'm a fan of Yes is Fragile, where there's really only three full band songs in the album and the rest are sort of these little miniature compositions made by the various members. And I feel like that works. I don't understand why I can't think about this working. It seems like it should. Um, so we'll, we'll delve into it further and see if it all pulls together in a way. Um, it does kind of lend itself to feeling inconsistent because of the variety on the album, but that may be just me being resistant to it because I had so much, such an affinity for that first album. It seemed to have such a clear vision and, uh, seeing how this vision is expanding, it feels a little uncomfortable, but that's just, that may be me being resistant to it. But I still think musically it's a great disc and one that I, as I listen to it, I'm always very uh, fascinated by the various musical moves that it makes throughout the course of its, of its runtime. Okay, that's it. Six albums. I'm done with all of this uh, previews for now. I'll probably have another one maybe early March uh, whenever I've uh, kind of amassed enough music to do another sort of roundup preview post. Um, but for now, it's plenty of stuff to think about in the coming months. Starting next week, uh, I will start doing more dedicated posts on, on things maybe from last year or maybe classic albums. Uh, and if you want to know when those things are coming out, you have no excuse not to figure out when it's happening. You can subscribe. You can like it. You can share it out. You can subscribe and, and hit the little bell so you get subscription notices. Follow me over on Spotify. You can hear all this new music. I'm kind of making an ongoing list of songs as I'm going through the year. And also, there's discussion groups over on Facebook. So if you're a person that just want to know more and want to be more connected and part of the conversations that me and the viewers are having, please do. I, I welcome that. Hopefully, I'll hear from you soon. And until then, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. <laughs>